when I was young, um, my formative experience was very much shaped um, by the narrative around us uh, in, in the end of the 90s, in Eastern Europe, in Hungary, when I am from. Um, the problems uh, that we faced around that time were in, a, in line with this desire to be connected to Western Europe, to be a part of an elite group of countries and share the values, especially the freedom um, and um, economic development um, and the chances that Western European countries uh, have and, and the citizens of those countries. So we've been uh, in a group uh, when I was young, who wanted to travel, wanted to enjoy freedom of movement, and wanted to study abroad. Therefore, it has been a desire for, for my generation very much to, to belong uh, to, to the accident in Europe. Um, but it was also a time which was fueled by optimism, uh, optimism of the politicians and optimism of the country has been just, you know, uh, over the fall of communism and the Iron Curtain and developing to be uh, an open democracy. It has been, um, you know, somehow catching up, catching up with the legal standards and uh, catching up with uh, the values of Europe, uh, developing and growing to, um, to a country and to a to a place where where academic freedom and an open democratic debate could go on, um, the flourishing of the civic society, um, the narrative was really diverse. Um, a spectrum of uh, new ideas flourished um, about how to reform uh, Europe to have uh, an equal place for the East. You know, what really matters, uh, I think, is, is the standpoint, the viewpoint from which you see the reality. And for us um, Eastern Europeans, the narrative was very much about um, understanding the criteria of getting into this elite group of Westerners. And I'm thinking about, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, idealistic, utopistic <laughs> um, ideas about what it means to be European. At that time, we didn't know exactly uh, what will happen when the country will be part of the Union, when we will have all those freedoms. Um, we thought um, very much that eventually, you know, we will be all equal. And during the time, of course, uh, during this learning process, we, we understood that Europe still today, you know, um, great discrepancies. Uh, in northern eastern Hungary, um, that is one of the most impoverished part of the European Union today. And what we hoped, especially my communities where, I, where I'm coming from, that the development will, will be, you know, fueled also through those communities. And they've been also um, aspiring to, to get into a better position. And um, for many, it happened, who've been able to move. And for many who stayed uh, in Hungary, they still living in one of the most impoverished regions of the European Union. Overall, I think there is less uh, of optimism uh, and uh, people are more reluctant and um, they not so open anymore uh, to develop. Uh, they are finding answers in their localities to the problems and would not look so much for um, international examples. Um, the, the, the overall globalization, so to say, had um, an effect to those parts of Europe which are less developed. And um, it is harder for us to imagine um, what... Uh, uh, a properly working European Union would look alike. How the functions, uh, responsibilities would be equally uh, divided among the members and how we would have an equal say. Right? So the, 
the discrepancies between more and less developed parts of Europe are more visible today. And it comes through the decision-making mechanisms as well. So I think there is a huge way ahead in order to integrate that part of Europe, which is still in, in let's say, in, in, in a worst position. And, and it's not just about the GDP and the economic capital or the chances of the, of the civic society to, to raise certain questions in, in certain countries, but it's also about the ability um, of the country itself to, to raise certain questions that are important. I think Brexit was an important point. Um, because um, I think um, the UK and France as well as Germany had an important drive to kind of patron <laughs> the rest of the countries towards a, a greater European goal, a better Europe. Um, but nowadays it seems that, you know, some of the countries and um, the communities who have been not going through that open democratic process after the war are less developed and also their mindset is different, meaning that they cannot exercise um, uh, on a daily level the freedoms that Westerners do. So our democracies are not real democracies, right? Especially I reflect now to, to Hungary and, and Poland where we have, you know, the checks and balances not in the right place where we don't have independence uh, of, of the judicial system. It is especially important uh, to emphasize the position from, from which you develop the, the narrative itself, as I said. And I know that depending on where we are in Europe and what we went through uh, during history, we might have a very different point and a very different conclusion we see ahead of us. So what I feel, and Ruth was saying this very important sentence during the, during the panel today, that we need to see that the emancipation movement of the women and what change uh, their role go through over the century in order to get a little inspiration so that we can potentially see um, you know, those economic differences, disparities, more equal, so that we can imagine uh, reforming a more equal Europe, uh, uh, a Europe that is inclusive, that is um, definitely open to differences, that is giving chances based on the talent, that is giving, uh, you know, uh, offering uh, various narratives, a spectrum of narratives that, that each of the European people could definitely find something that resonates to them. At the moment, we are not, not in an optimistic stage. <laughs> um, but this might change. Um, uh, that was another very important um, chapter of this uh, day during the conference. And I think that is especially true to, to the Eastern European part, that that was a pattern ahead of us, you know, during the accession policies, during the years of the accession, there has been some kind of a, like a, a bigger brother who would, who would tell us what should be done in terms of the legal revisions, what kind of criteria we need to fulfill in order to join, right? And after, you know, more than 15 years, we still kind of would need that drive, uh, the patron, hmm? mm -hmm. to show the way how policies and uh, daily uh, political actions needs to be done better in order to fit this diverse spectrum of Europe. And I'm not sure it is actually possible under the circumstances where we are today, where we're living today. They definitely coexist. They coexist today. Uh, you do have those very radical extreme right-wing opinions uh, raised out loud, uh, as well as you have, you know, uh, leftish radical ideas raised out 
loud. So you have the whole spectrum and the narratives are quite outspoken. It's just about that, that, you know, after the Second World War, there was a certain time, a period, uh, where political correctness wouldn't allow to raise all those questions. And it seems that that period is ended. Mm -hmm. And today you can be outspoken about issues that were absolutely not uh, tolerated 20 years before. So in a sense, we are not heading to a, to a more uh, open, uh, inclusive society, but to a society which is uh, confrontative, to a narrative that is getting radical, um, and also, you know, overall, I, I'm not a pessimistic person, so I wouldn't say that, that the war uh, of the different actors and um, conflicting narratives will lead us to some kind of, you know, um, absolute misunderstanding and isolation uh, in the discussion, in the discourse about Europe. I'd like to believe that there will be people who will be able to unite uh, various fractions of the narratives and will be leading us towards, uh, towards a better European idea.